are going to be in the book of Genesis again, in the 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis. Uh, as you, if, if you've been with us, if you haven't been with us, maybe you've missed a, a, a few services or so, but uh, I don't know how long I've been doing this, but we've been, been looking at the life of Abraham, uh, watching his walk with the Lord, and, and we've decided that, that Abraham is a lot like us. When he started, he what? He just stepped out on faith. Uh, didn't know everything he needed to know. Uh, wasn't sure about where he was going, but he believed God, and as the Bible said, it was counted unto him for righteousness. And uh, he stepped out on faith. Uh, we watched him grow, and now we're going to take a look at what has to be the biggest trial he's ever going to face in his life. Uh, 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis. When you all find your place, I'd ask you to stand to your feet for just a brief moment in reverence to the word of the Lord. It says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I shall tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and cleaved the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went unto the place which the Lord had told him. Then, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes, and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto the young man, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder, and worship, and come again unto you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we ask that your spirit lead us and guide us in all that we think and do and say. Show us what you have for us in your word. Show us what we haven't seen. Teach us, Lord, that we may apply the truths to our lives and better serve you and bring you praise, honor, and delight. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. We started off with what we read today by saying, and God did tempt Abraham. Now, if we were to take that to the book of James, in the very first chapter, God says there that he cannot be tempted with evil, and therefore he tempted no man. But we know that God said there he tempted Abraham. Greek language is, is something like that. Have you ever heard anybody say, that's Greek to me? Well, a lot of its pronunciations are Greek to me. I can't say the words. But I've got a little book. Well, it's not little. It's a, it's a pretty good-sized book. And it covers the words that are in the Bible. It covers them in Greek. And if they weren't in Greek, it's got a little Hebrew section there that you can look up the Hebrew word. It's called Strong. 
Bible dictionary. And it is immensely useful to me as I strive to understand the Word of God. And it's interesting that this Greek word for tempted can also be used for trial or tested or temptation. It's all the same word. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, what is the difference then between a trial or a test, which we know from the way we've been studying Abraham, which we know comes from God? And what is a temptation? James says what? The temptations come from within us. They're from our own lusts. How we handle something can either be a temptation or it can be a trial. Temptations sometimes seem perfectly logical to us, perfect, makes perfect sense to us. It's, it's perfectly logical to want to be successful in life, isn't it? To want to be successful in our business or in our whatever it is, occupation that we, we want to face. But if we cheat to bring that success to us, then we've allowed that trial go out into the world and be fruitful. Then we've allowed that trial to all of a sudden become a temptation because we have tried to satisfy that need, which is a perfectly good need by a bad means. And so how we treat things that come into our life is what makes things either a trial or a temptation. When God first came to Abraham, he came what? He just came and said, Abraham, get thee up. It was a, a, a tri trial of Abraham's faith. Was Abraham going to believe God? And he got up and he went in, not knowing where he was going, as the Bible says, <clears throat> what was going to be required of him. But he got up and obeyed God. And came a trial of a famine. Abraham failed that test, didn't he? Instead of depending on God to supply for his needs, he went down to Egypt. And he reaped some things down there that I'm sure if he were to look back, hindsight's always 2020, isn't it? That he would look back and he said, I wish I never would have never would have got that. I wish I never would have had that. But he began to grow in the word of the Lord, began to grow in an understanding of what God wanted from him. When he got back from Egypt, all of a sudden him and Lot had to split up. They had too many possessions. Imagine that. Too many possessions. Reminds me of the, of the verse that Paul wrote to Timothy. Contentment with godliness is great gain. If we could be satisfied with what God gives us, we would be a whole lot better off. And sometimes we turn that, that blessing of God, that blessing with what he has given us into a temptation because we want more of it, don't we? When they got back and they realized that they had to split him and Lot, he gave Lot the choice, didn't he? That was a, a, the, the trial of fellowship. Are you, are you going to want everything for yourself? Or are you going to think of other people? Philippians says that we need, second chapter, I think it's the third verse, says that we need to think about other people. We need to put them before ourselves sometimes. What's going to be better for other people and not just for ourselves? Abraham passed that test. But you know something? Because Lot wasn't following the word of the Lord, I'm sure it probably troubled Abraham at times. I'm sure Abraham probably said to himself, if I hadn't given Lot the choice, maybe he never would have ended up in Sodom. Sometimes even when we do the right thing, we don't control the actions of other people, do we? But our relationship with the Lord grows. Sometimes we'll take, take blame for something that we do that's right. 
because other people are going to construe it as something that's that's not right that's something that shouldn't have been done when we tell people that there's only one way to god we're considered narrow-minded and intolerant but we're telling them the truth and we must never depart from that truth abraham got impatient with the lord sarah came up with a pretty good idea hey we're supposed to have a child uh, maybe he means for you to have this child with hagar maybe that's where it needs to go abraham got impatient didn't he He failed that test and that started uh, something that's that's still going on today it's called the arab israeli uh, conflict and it's still in effect today we're dealing with the effects of that disobedience there abraham passed the test when he found out that God was going to destroy Sodom. And what did he do? He prayed for the people there. He asked God, if, if there's just got it all the way down to 10, if there's just 10 righteous people, and God said, I won't destroy the city for 10 sake. But it was sad in the whole city, and it was a big city. There were not 10 righteous people. was four and one of them looked back but God got them out of the city didn't he he knows how to save the righteous he knows how to get them and like I've told you before I never thought his lot being a righteous man his walk didn't show him but the Bible says he was and now Abraham was going to face the hardest test that God was ever going to give him because God gave Sarah the son that was promised and he even told him he said if you go back to the 21st chapter and look at that 12th verse uh, he said and God said unto Abraham uh, that was when he was sending uh, uh, Ishmael away it says uh, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman in all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Isaac was the son of promise. Isaac was the miracle child. And Abraham knew it. And Abraham had been walking with God now since he was 75 and he was maybe 115 120 some some estimates put him a little older but I don't think he was older than that Isaac was a teenager surely young strapping boy and Abraham loved him so imagine Abraham's thoughts when God said to him Abraham and what did he answer he answered right up front didn't he he, he didn't hesitate. He told him right up front, here I am. Take thy son, thy only son, whom thou lovest, and go to a place, I'm, I'm going to show you where to go, and offer him there as a burnt sacrifice. Everything that Abraham thought up to that point must have been running around in his head how can i do this <coughs> besides the love that he felt for this boy there was the love that he felt for god one was against the other how do i do this how can i how can i do what he said but the next day the very next day he saddled up the, the pack mule he loaded wood got two boys to help him two young men it says and he set out what gave Abraham the ability to be able to do that because if we can understand how Abraham could obey then we can obey better in our lives because I don't know I don't think that we're ever gonna get asked to take our son, our only son, 
an offering as a burnt offering. I don't think that's going to happen, not to anybody here. But if we can follow God in that situation, as Abraham did, we can follow God in the trials and the tests that come to each and every one of our lives. And they all come. We've been looking at the tests of Abraham. Those tests have been coming. If you all will think and sit now and, and just think about things that have happened in your life, each and every one of you will come up with a, a test that God has given. And maybe you've walked through it, and maybe you're thinking about it now, and maybe you're saying, yeah, I didn't understand that as a test then. But once I got through it, I could see what God was trying to do. I can understand. Or maybe as I think about it, maybe I can't see what God was doing. But maybe I can see how it worked out. Because when we get tasked, what's, what, what's the first thing that, that, that we want to ask? Why? Why is this thing happening to us? Why is this coming on? You think Abraham said, Lord, why? You've told me that he's... He's the child of promise. He's going to be the father of, a, well, I'm going to be the father, Abraham said, but he's the one, he's the seed that's going to perpetuate a great nation. That's the one that it's going to come through. Abraham had already asked to God, he said, oh, that Ishmael might reign. And God said, no, he's not the son of promise. He's not Ishmael. It's going to be Isaac. And now God is saying, Take him up, build an altar, and offer him. What made Abraham <coughs> obey? Most of the time when this is preached, it's preached with, oh, this was just a, 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 fore, a foreshot of what Jesus was going to do. And surely we can see Jesus in that. We can see the Father in this, can't we? boy carrying the wood on his back going up the mountain, Jesus carrying the cross, going up the mountain to Golgotha. <coughs> the Father offering up the Son. God offering up Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. We can see it all there, but I want you to look at something else here this morning. What made Abraham Abraham had been walking since he was 75. He'd been walking with the Lord. He had been through trials. He had grown. And one thing that we have to remember, God will not put more on us than we are able to handle. He would never have put this, this test on Lot because Lot was spiritually immature. Even though he was a righteous man, he was spiritually immature. He could have never handled this trial. But God put this trial on Abraham because Abraham had been walking with the Lord. He had communed with the Lord. He had come to know the Lord and know his ways. And so Abraham, maybe not understanding, boy, there's nothing better than for us to obey the Lord when we don't truly understand what he's doing. But we obey him because he's God. And because we believe he's in charge. Doesn't that say a lot about our belief when we're willing to obey God simply because he's God? We don't have to understand. Don't expect God to give us explanations for everything that happens because he's not going to do it. He's not obligated to do it. But he will tell us what we need to know. And he will put tests or trials on us when we're ready for them. Each one tailor-made for us. Lot couldn't have taken this, this test, but Abraham could. Abraham had been talking to God. He knew God's voice. There was no doubt in Abraham's mind who, who he was talking to when, when he said Abraham, he knew his voice. It's just like talking to somebody on the phone before the days of uh, uh, caller ID and things like that. You know, uh, you didn't know who was calling and you might have picked up the phone. But if you had been talking to that person, if you were in fellowship with that person and knew who he was, 
you might say hello, and they started to speak, and you knew exactly how it was. They didn't have to identify themselves because they were a friend. That's the point that Abraham had gotten to with God. He knew God's voice. He knew when he was talking to God, and he knew when Satan was trying to tempt him. He had learned that. He had learned that with go down to Egypt and get fed. Go, go into Hagar and have that son. He had learned all that, and he knew when God was speaking to him and God wasn't speaking to him. And that's something that can only come from walking with the Lord, and that's something that each and every one of us ought to be doing. We ought to be getting closer and closer to the Lord each and every day. If we're not closer, then we're further away because God's not standing still. He's moving, and we got to keep up. We do that through studying his word. We do, do that through, through obeying the commands that he gives us. But we have to be in touch with the Lord. What was Abraham thinking of? He was not thinking of the demands that were coming on him. What was Abraham thinking of? He was thinking of the promise of God. And that's what we need to be focused on when trials come our way. We need to be focused on the promises of God. 1 Corinthians, I think it's the 10th chapter. God says, I'm not going to tempt you more than you're able to stand. And with the temptation, I'll always give you a way of escape. God's not going to put more on us than what we can stand. And he'll always allow us to see the way out. Either through obedience or through Obedience about getting away from something. We can either get into the word more or we can get out of the situations and the environments that we're in. But we've got to do one or the other. We can't stay where we are. And God expects us to be obedient to him. Abraham knew who he was talking to. He had a personal relationship with God and he was willing to obey him. This was a test for Abraham and Abraham alone. If we were to read a little further on, it says here, he said, uh, I'm, I'm going on, me and the lad are going on. He was telling the two young men, you stay here. Abraham went on by himself. There's some tests that we have to go through just by ourselves. It's great to have people to depend on, isn't it? We, I, I, I depend on so many people in, in, in my life. But things happen. People pass on. People move. Some of the people that I used to depend on, they're not around me anymore, and I can't depend on them anymore. And so they're gone. And, and sometimes you've got to walk through a trial by yourself. But if it's your trial, and God's given it to you, then you need to do it. We need the encouragement from other people, yes. But think about the encouragement we can get from God's Word. Because it's covered here. I've often wondered why God told us these, these accounts. Why, why we have all that. And it's just so we can learn. When we get in similar situations, we can say, hey, there's something in the Bible about that. How did they handle that? And we can go and look. And God says we can learn from that. And we can ease our burden. Jesus said, walk with me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. When we're yoked to Jesus, we're not on our own, are we? We got him right next to us. And he's saying, learn from me. He's saying, I'll lead the way. All you've got to do is, is just step with me and follow with me and keep up. And I'll teach you. And that's how we learn to walk with Jesus, by being yoked to him. Abraham told those two young boys, you stay here. This is something for just me and Isaac. We're going to go up, and we're going to worship, and then we'll come back down. Abraham didn't know what was going to happen on that mountain. But he did know. One way or another, 
him and Isaac were going to come down that mountain. If he offered Isaac as a burnt offering, he knew that the Lord was going to raise him back up again. He held on to God's promise. God had promised him that what? Isaac was the seed. Isaac was your descendant that Jesus Christ was going to come from. It was going to be from Isaac. God never asks us to do anything or never asks us to go through anything that's going to contradict his word. If you hear somebody say, well, you know, uh, uh, God's, God's told me to divorce my wife and leave my family and head out to the West Coast and open up a taco stand, you can pretty much say he's listening to the wrong voice. That's not God that told him that. Because God's not going to say, leave your family. God's not going to say, divorce your wife. God's going to say, reconcile whatever's wrong. And that's what we need to keep in mind. The promises of God and not the situations that we face. Because if we hang on to the promises of God, then we've got a bright future. But if we keep looking at the world and we see all the dark things that are going on right now, it's going to be pretty dismal, isn't it? We're not going to think that we have much hope for the world to come. But if we hold on to the promises of God, we will. God's made me a promise. He's made me a promise that, that if I will turn my life over to him, if I will give myself to the Lord, if I will ask him to come into my life, he will. And he'll give me, if I believe in him, and said he will give me what? Eternal life. Does that mean I'm going to live on this earth forever? No. Physically, I might suffer death if the Lord delays his coming. But I will never die eternally because death is not the end. <laughs> And I shall have life, and I shall have it in fellowship with God and not separated from him. He's made me that promise. He said, if I'll walk with you, he'll supply for my needs. He's done that in my life abundantly. Every promise that God has made, he has kept. He has never lied to me. People will lie to you. Friends will lie to you. God has never lied to me. He didn't say it would be easy. He said, you try and live my way, you're going to suffer persecution. You're going to have some hard times. And you know something? I'm even going to test you every now and again. And with that test might come heartache. And with that test might come pain. But if you will hang on to that promise, I'll be with you, and you'll be able to stand. Abraham went up, built the altar, laid the wood on it. Isaac had already asked him, where's the lamb? He said, God will supply a lamb. And you got a 120-year-old man and a teenage boy. It says he bound Isaac and put him on the altar. I don't know that I can take a teenage boy and I'm not 120 years old. He had bought up Isaac in the admonition of the Lord. And even Isaac didn't understand what was going on. But he was willing to father, follow his father. Just as Abraham was willing to follow God. Raises the knife. Don't do it, Abraham. I was testing you. And you passed this test. You were willing to obey me, even though it meant giving up something that you loved. What are we willing to give up for the Lord? Would it be success, worldly success? Because we can give up worldly success. We're here for but a short time. We're just vapors. We're just vapors. Would we be willing to give up worldly success 
Would we be willing to give up friends that we love if it meant following the Lord? If it meant, if doing what the Lord was going to make people flee from us? Boy, I, don't, I used to be able to go down with him and, and have a couple of beers and, and, and just, you know, uh, but now all he wants to do is talk about that Bible. All he wants to do is bring that word out. All he wants to do is say, well, I don't think I ought to be going down there because that wouldn't bring honor and glory to God. And he died for me. I don't understand all that stuff, but I know I don't like it and I'm not going to hang around with that anymore. Sometimes it costs us. Sometimes it costs us things, friends, that we truly care for. But God cares for us more than any friend does. God did more for us than any friend ever did. And God has promised us eternal life. That's the promise that we need to hold on to. Abraham says, me and the boy are going to return. He was holding on to that promise, wasn't he? He said, we'll come back. We'll, we'll see you in a little bit. We're, we're going up there to worship. His worship was what? Obedience to the Lord. Isn't that a form of worship? His worship was obedience to God. And they went up there and worshiped. And it was they that worshiped because what? Isaac was just as obedient as Abraham was. They were obedient to the Lord and they came again. Now, I know. Who was that test for? Did God know what Abraham was going to do? He's omnipotent. Surely he knew what Abraham was going to do. Who was that test for? I think that test was for Abraham. Remember? Remember when you went, you didn't believe me when I said I'd feed you? Remember when you didn't believe me when I said, I'm going to give you a son? Remember all those times that you doubted me? They were past in Abraham's life now. Now, he was following the Lord and following him wholly. Holy being with every bit in him. We, we think and we look forward to the day that we are going to get our resurrected body. I made a statement this morning. I think the thing I'm going to appreciate most is not having the sin nature anymore. Having that, that desire to do things that God doesn't want me to do. Having that desire out of me. And there will come a time when, when that will be out of me. Right now, I'm susceptible to, to everything. And I have to walk closely with the Lord because he's the one that can nudge me in the ribs and say, you need to get out of here. You need to do something else. One day that will happen. But right now, I need to walk with the Lord, and I need to walk closely with him. And the closer we walk, the more we obey him, the more he'll open up himself to us. Abraham couldn't have stood this test previously. You realize that's kind of, as, as your tests get more involved and they get harder, it's kind of a compliment, isn't it? Because God saith, you're coming along. Before, I just had to give you a test with addition and subtraction. But now, we can deal with multiple, you know, multiplication and, and, and division. We can deal with those things now. As, as we walk with the Lord and follow him closer, our tests will get harder. But believe me, there's nothing we can't overcome. Is there anything too hard for God? Or in the words of Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I don't know what anybody might be going through here today. But I know, without a doubt, that if you...